Before you start this lesson today, you may wish to print the attached document. Hopefully your teacher has sent to you a Word document which has um, some text that you'll want to use later on in the presentation. I have embedded it in the slides as well, but it is a little bit small for reading and I would ideally like you to do some highlighting on it. So if you can print it, please do that now. So pause the slides and do that. In this lesson, we're going to have a look at what genetic screening is. So I want you to think a little bit about what a scientist working on genetic screening might need to know about using your knowledge from the previous lessons. And are there any questions about genetic screening that you think science could not answer for you? By way of a starter, I would like you to have a go at drawing a palette square for two parents who carry alleles for the cystic fibrosis condition. So um, in the table, you can see the genotypes, big C, big C, big C, little c, and small c, small c, um, and the phenotypes or whether or not those individuals would have cystic fibrosis. And I want you to calculate the likelihood of any offspring of that couple having the cystic fibrosis condition. You need to show the ratio for each type and I'd also like you please to indicate which of those genotypes that you show in your Punnett square would produce a child that has cystic fibrosis. I will put a slide at the end just to show you what the answer to the Punnett square should be. So if you could pause the slide and do that now please. OK, so this is the last in the series of lessons that we are doing um, during this term. And this lesson is specifically about genetic screening. So we've had a look at a couple of inherited disorders. And these are the ones that you really do need to know about for your exam. I'm just going to go over those briefly to remind you from last week. And then we're going to go into ways in which we can um, do some genetic screening. So today. After today's lesson, you should be able to identify why some embryos may need to be screened, describe how those embryos could be screened, and also evaluate some of those embryo screening processes. Now, at the bottom of the slide, we have some keywords. We've got embryo, which is fairly obvious, screening obvious. We've also got ethics in there. And this is an area of the GCSE course that the examiner particularly like to choose for a question on ethics. OK, so you do lots of work on ethics in other subjects as well. So um, you wouldn't be surprised to get a question that asked you about ethics in such a sort of delicate area of this science. OK, amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling are the testing processes that you might use to screen an embryo. So let's quickly recap on how characteristics are inherited. And we've learnt previously that the DNA that we inherit from our parents, both of the parents, contribute to our genotype and to our phenotype. Now, any particular gene might have different variations of that gene, and we call those alleles. A different allele might code for a different protein. OK, so again, we've talked about things like eye colour. Um, and you get different proteins contributing to the final outcome, the phenotype for a particular condition or characteristic. Some of our characteristics or our phenotypes are controlled by more than one gene, things like eye colour and things like nose shape. Attached earlobes, however, is only going to be controlled by a single gene. OK, so you remember that you have to be able to draw Planet square diagrams, planet cross diagrams, um, genetic diagrams, they sometimes call them in the exams, but draw a planet square to show how those characteristics can be inherited in any particular situation. And it might be a condition or a characteristic that you've never come across before. The exam board are perfectly within their rights to test you on this um, skill. OK, so let's just think about cystic fibrosis again. Again, the exam board expects you to know what cystic fibrosis is and the fact that it's caused by a recessive allele. OK, if you remember, it primarily affects the lungs, the digestive system and somewhat the reproductive system. And in particular, it works at membranes. So the um, 
allele, the recessive allele that causes this condition means that the membranes don't allow substances to pass through as easily as they normally would and that's because they produce a, or cause a sort of a mucus to be produced and that makes the cells of that membrane very sticky okay and that can stop your lungs from working properly in particular so um, cystic fibrosis sufferers do have a lot of problem with their lungs and I think I mentioned previously that exercise can alleviate the symptoms but they will need quite significant physiotherapy probably daily to try and keep that condition under control and remove that mucus from their lungs so we do have scientists now working on some gene replacement therapy a form of genetic engineering and that's to try and cure the condition by replacing the faulty alleles okay so moving on the other condition that we have learned about is polydactyly hopefully you can recall that this condition um, is controlled by a single dominant allele so if you have one copy of this allele you will uh, suffer from if you like polydactyly and that means you will have some extra fingers toes or both quite often people have that digit removed when um, a child is very very young and they can just clip off the extra finger um, because at that point the bones are very soft and the the digit for instance is very small okay um, other diseases that are um, controlled by a dominant allele include Huntingdon's disease and we talked about that a little bit as well last time that develops in middle age and affects the nervous system and will eventually lead to death you can look that up on the internet if you're interested to find out exactly what sort of condition that is so what I'd like you to do next is just pause the slide and in your own words I want you to summarize what you understand by cystic fibrosis and polydactyly because you will be expected to know what they are whether they are controlled by dominant or recessive alleles Okay, so let's do that now, please. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the main idea of the lesson, which is about embryo screening. So hopefully you can recall from your lessons about reproduction that when the egg and the sperm combine, fertilization takes place and initially a zygote is produced and that divides and divides to form the embryo, the fetus, eventually the baby when it is born. Okay, so um, screening of embryos usually um, refers to testing both embryos and fetuses and um, also um, embryonic fluid. So that can be done before implantation of the embryo if there has been an IVF cycle involved in a particular pregnancy. Um, otherwise, embryos can be screened in the uterus using a couple of different processes, and those are chorionic villus sampling and amniocentesis. You may well have heard of amniocentesis, but I'd be surprised if you'd heard of chorionic villus sampling. Okay, so we're going to have a look at what those things actually are. And what I want you to do at this point, if you have it, is pick up the piece of text that I asked you to print. Okay, and you're going to do some highlighting. So the first thing I want you to do is read through that text and highlight the descriptions of why each of the tests is done. Okay, if you were not able to print the sheet, then the um, information is on the following two slides. Okay, so here is the first one. You can pause your um, presentation and read that now. And here is the second one. You can see that the text is quite dense, so hopefully you have been able to print or maybe you can print these two slides. OK, when you've done that first bit, I want you to read through the text again and in a different colour, highlight the description of how the test is actually carried out. OK, so how do they do the embryonic screening by each of the methods we've mentioned? And then finally, read through it again and in a third colour, highlight the problems that each of these tests might cause for the embryo or the mother. Okay, you should have all of your information highlighted now, and I would like you to produce a table which has the two tests in the first column. So we've got amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. Uh, you should have some information about why the particular tests are carried out how they would be done and any problems that they might cause.
OK, so on the next slide, um, I have given you nine different statements about some concerns to do with screening. And I want you to rank those in a diamond. So you're going to sort of flip your page around if you like, or um, draw a diamond on your page if you're quite good at sketching. And I want you to please put the most concerning of the problems or concerns that the screening might cause at the top and the least concerning at the bottom. OK, and I want you to justify your decision. That means you can't just say what your decision is as to where it goes. You need to say why. OK, you have put it in that particular place. OK, so justify being in a command word. There would be extra marks for this in the exam um, rather than just making a statement. We need to know why. So always think when you get something like this of the why. These are the nine different um, ideas about different things that can cause concern with sampling from the fetus or from the amniotic fluid. OK, so for instance, the main one top left hand side, the sampling may increase the risk of miscarriage. OK, so I want you to go and read through all of those, please, and put those into your diamond. Next thing I'd like you to do, please, is launch the video or type it in if you're watching this as an MP4 file. Um, it's a video about a couple who are going to a counsellor. Um, they know that they have the potential to produce a child with a genetic condition and they're going to talk with her about some various different options that they might take uh, to try and reduce the risk of having the child with the genetic condition. OK, so the video is about four minutes long. When you've done that, come back to the slideshow, please. So now I want you to use your knowledge and some information that you picked up in that video to construct an argument for a couple with a family history of cystic fibrosis to have their embryo screened. And it's important when you get a question like this in the exam that you put both sides of the argument. So an argument is always a two sided thing, isn't it? So it's no good for you just to say, I agree that because the couple have a fam family history of cystic fibrosis, they should be allowed to have the screening. You need to present information from both sides of the argument and then you will pick up the extra marks. When you've done that, I want you to go on and make the same argument, please, for a couple that have a family history of polydactyly to not have their embryo screened. OK, so slightly different problems here. Obviously, one is going to affect lifestyle much more than the other. OK, and one is more easily dealt with than the other. So you have to give a good argument for each of those. OK, if you want to do a stretch and challenge activity on the previous side, it did say how screening might take place at 11 weeks. And on here we have got um, a summary of how screening could take place at 18 weeks. Obviously, that's much further into the pregnancy. OK, and gives you slightly different perspective on what might need to be done. OK, your teacher will attach to your lesson um, on Show My Homework a couple of exam questions that you may wish to do. Um, again, on here, I've got a little stretch and challenge activity, and that's going back to a topic that you will have learned about last year, summarising what osmosis is. OK, so this is a, a tri tricky topic um, of transport across cell membranes, and you have to be absolutely 100 percent clear that you know the difference between osmosis, diffusion and active transport. So that's just a little sort of a recall task for you. Finally, you can do a bit of self-assessment, giving yourself two stars and a wish for this lesson. Think about what you did well and what you would need to improve on. OK, and maybe have a little think about why people would have such different views about screening. Finally, on the last slide, I want you to have a look at the Punnett square that I've constructed for you and check back to what you wrote down at the start of this lesson to see whether or not you have the same as me and whether or not you have come out with the same outcomes for um, the particular genotypes that were given for cystic fibrosis. Thank you. So now we'll go back to our starter example of individuals having cystic fibrosis. And if you recall, we had a father who was small c, small c. So he was homozygous recessive 
for the cystic fibrosis gene and that means from the table at the top you can see that he has cystic fibrosis. We have a mother who is heterozygous for the cystic fibrosis gene. So we need to construct a Punnett square and yours should look something like this. I have put my mother's um, genotype across the top and my father's down the side. I think I've mentioned before that the exam board don't care which way round you do this. You would gain full marks regardless of which way round they were. You then needed to have filled in your outcome boxes, which would be a combination of the alleles from the father and the mother. So you can see we have two um, outcomes that are big C, little c, so heterozygous. And we have two outcomes that are little c, little c, which are homozygous recessive. Now, the offspring, the potential offspring that would be sufferers of cystic fibrosis, we need to indicate by putting a circle around them. This is what the exam board means by indicating which of the offspring would have the condition. You can do it by having a little key on the side, but I think this is the easiest way, really. Um, if you just circle the ones that you know have cystic fibrosis and just write next to it that they have cystic fibrosis. And then if we look at the chance of the offspring having cystic fibrosis, you can see that two out of the four potential outcomes give individuals with cystic fibrosis. So that means we have a 50% chance of the offspring having cystic fibrosis. Or we could say that it's a ratio of one to one because we've got two that have cystic fibrosis and two that do not have cystic fibrosis. OK, so two to two is reduced to one to one. You can see, though, that the um, the remaining two are carriers of the allele for cystic fibrosis. And therefore, if they're very unlucky and go on to have um, children with another individual that also carries a cystic fibrosis allele, they may themselves produce children with cystic fibrosis. OK, thank you.